As we get started, just a quick live read. Please check out the books you can find at milwaukeemob.com. From mafia to horror, fans of my show might enjoy Bones Beneath the Pale. You'll never look at large insects the same again. 1980 was an especially violent year for Toledo, Ohio. Situated in northwest Ohio, due south of Detroit, Michigan, the port city had a population of about 355,000 people and was ravaged by 60 homicides, setting an all-time record that stood until just recently. In the most talked-about homicide of that year, Sister Margaret Ann Paul was strangled and stabbed at least 27 times on April 5th. Her body was found in the St. Joseph Chapel at Toledo's Mercy Hospital, where she served as the caretaker. Deputy Police Chief Ray Vetter's initial assumption was that the killer was some screwball off the street. The truth, however, would shock the city and be talked about for decades to come. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this episode has a special surprise at the end, so please be sure to listen all the way through. Now, back to the story. April 5th, 1980 was Holy Saturday, the day before Easter Sunday, and considered to be one of the holiest days of the year in the Roman Catholic religion. It was also the day... Sister Margaret was found murdered in the chapel of Toledo Mercy Hospital in Toledo, Ohio, just one day shy of her 72nd birthday. Sister Margaret was a nun in the Sisters of Mercy Order of Catholic Nuns, which was founded in Dublin, Ireland in 1831. Sister Margaret was a nun for her entire adult life, and in childhood she even knew that she had a calling to be a nun. At Mercy Hospital, she provided ministry to the sick and terminally ill at the hospital. And she also worked as a hospital chapel's caretaker. By all accounts, she did a great job at providing ministry and comfort to the patients at the hospital. On that fateful morning, Sister Margaret was inside the chapel preparing for Holy Saturday Mass to be held later that day and Easter Sunday Mass the following day. Unfortunately, Sister Margaret wouldn't live to see her birthday or Easter Sunday. Her body was discovered in the chapel, having been strangled and stabbed more than 30 times, including nine wounds across her chest in the shape of an inverted cross, which was a satanic symbol. She was partially covered in an altar cloth, which had absorbed much of the blood. Blood was also smeared across her forehead, as if someone had administered her the Catholic sacrament of last rites. Not only did this look like a grisly murder, it also appeared to be a satanic ritual. And for those of you too young to remember, American society in the 1970s and 80s had lots of reference to the occult, satanic rituals, and the like. It also appeared as if Sister Margaret had been sexually assaulted, although it's not exactly clear if that was ever verified. There happened to be two police officers inside the hospital just sitting down for breakfast when a nurse came running to them frantically screaming about the nun's bloodied body. As the officers raced to the chapel, so did two chaplains at the hospital, one of whom was Father Gerald Robinson. As part of the police investigation, they questioned hundreds of persons of interest. These included hospital staffers, transients in the area, mental health patients, prisoners, other nuns with the Sisters of Mercy, the Catholic ministers who worked with Sister Margaret, and Father Robinson. 
Robinson, who was the celebrant at Sister Margaret's funeral mass, was questioned by police after they found a letter opener in his desk. At that time, word about the sword-shaped letter opener had not yet been made public, and Robinson's particular letter opener matched up size-wise with some of the stab wounds. Police also noted that the priest appeared cold and aloof after seeing the slain body. For his part, Father Robinson, who grew up in Toledo, was seen as a pillar of the Toledo community. Author David Yonke, who wrote a book about Sister Margaret's murder, stated that Toledo was a very strong Catholic city. From what he saw, priests could not be arrested back then. If one did something wrong, they would be turned into the bishop, who would decide what course of action, if any, should be taken with the offending priest. Robinson took a number of polygraph tests and claimed to police that someone had admitted the murder to him during a confession. The Catholic religion has a strict code against revealing anything specific heard during the sacrament of confession, so Robinson argued that he could not reveal the admitting person's identity. He very quickly rescinded that claim, however. Father Robinson wasn't charged with any crimes, as the prosecutor stated at the time that there was insufficient evidence to obtain a conviction. It was speculated at the time, however, that there may have been an orchestrated cover-up for any possible crimes. That author, David Yonke, noted that the police chief at the time was a devout Catholic and very influential in the criminal justice world. Perhaps there was external pressure to not charge Robinson. Allegations of interference by the diocese have hung over the case since the Toledo Blade investigation revealed a long history of collusion between police and church officials in sex abuse cases. On the flip side, though, there was no physical evidence found at the murder scene. No fingerprints, no fabric threads or no blood, and no other evidence pointing to a killer. And eventually the case went cold. Fast forward to over two decades later, and the Catholic Church came under fire nationally for a barrage of claims that people had been abused by priests. In 2003, amongst these many complaints, a woman wrote a letter to the Toledo Catholic Diocese stating that she had been subjected to ritualized sex acts by members of clergy from the city. That letter was later forwarded from the Toledo Diocese to the Toledo Police Department, and it turned out that the letter identified Father Robinson as one of her abusers. Because of that claim, Toledo Police Detective Steve Forrester confirmed in 2004 that they reopened Sister Margaret's case. They went back and re-interviewed all the old witnesses from 1980 and used the latest technology to look into the case. One tool the police used this time was the analysis of blood transfer patterns. In 2004, this was a new, seldomly used tool that allowed police to study the patterns of blood from objects when they're laid down. The technology sparked outrage with Robinson's lawyer, who told the New York Times that it wasn't blood spatter and it wasn't DNA. But that didn't stop investigators from using the science. More damning to Robinson, however, was that police also determined that the sword-like letter opener discovered in Robinson's desk was, in fact, the murder weapon. On April 23, 2004, Father Robinson, who lived next door to the police station, was arrested and charged with the 1980 murder of Sister Margaret. He was now 66 years old. Just hours after his arrest, however, Robinson emerged from the jail to a group of ardent supporters. His arrest stunned the Toledo religious community, particularly St. Anthony's Parish, where he presided occasionally over Mass. Instead of turning on him, the parishioners at St. Anthony's established a Father Robinson defense fund, and several members took out loans putting up their homes as collateral toward meeting the $400,000 bond. Money for Robinson's legal defense was also raised by parishioners and other supporters. 
So Ray Vetter, a retired deputy chief of the original investigating team, confirmed after his arrest that Robinson was always considered a suspect, but police never had enough evidence to convict him. The evidence necessary for the arrest, of course, include the bloodstain pattern analysis and the conclusion that Robinson was, quote, in control of the murder weapon, although no information as to how that determination was made was ever really made public. Let's take just a quick second for a break, and we'll be right back. About five months after Robinson's arrest, Toledo police twice searched records of the Toledo Catholic Diocese, believing officials had misled them back in 1980 and even still in 2004. The diocese initially told detectives there were just three pages of records on Robinson, but the searches, which were supported by search warrants, revealed 148 pages of records. On December 31, 2005, Prosecutors reduced Robinson's charge from aggravated murder to murder. The original indictment meant that the priest would have planned the slaying, while the reduced charge only meant that he did intentionally commit murder, but had not planned it in advance. Both charges would carry sentences of life in prison, but the murder charge provided for parole eligibility after 15 years, while the original count of aggravated murder would only provide eligibility after 20 years. After being delayed twice, Robinson's trial finally began in April 2006, with plenty of national media paying attention. Lucas County Common Pleas Judge Thomas Oswawak planned to call 250 prospective jurors, more than the courts would normally summon for a capital murder trial. The city was divided as the trial began. On the first day of the trial, three witnesses laid a foundation for the state's case against Father Robinson. Robbery and rape were ruled out at this time because nothing of value was taken and there was no evidence of a sexual assault. Although, as we said, the nun's body was found with her jumper pulled up and undergarments down around her ankles. The sheer number of stab wounds told police that she most likely knew her killer. The strongest testimony on that first day of the trial came from William Kena, a Toledo police lieutenant who led the murder investigation until his retirement in 1981. William recalled that two witnesses interviewed by police in 1980 said they had heard someone running from the chapel toward where Robinson's housing unit was located. You see, Robinson actually had housing quarters at the hospital in an area where student nurses also lived, but according to William's testimony, most of the student nurses were gone for the Easter weekend. He also brought up how Robinson initially told police that the killer confessed to him, but then quickly withdrew that claim. This would seem to call Robinson's credibility into question with the jury. At least I know I would wonder about him if I were on the jury. William also testified that he and Detective Arthur Marks got Robinson's permission to search his quarters and that they found a saber-shaped letter opener in his desk. The coroner had told detectives to look for a knife with a blade at least three inches long, but not wider than half an inch and Robinson's letter opener fit that description. It was also testified later in the trial that the blade fit an unusual wound in Sister Margaret's face. It was akin to a key fitting into a lock. William testified that during a second interrogation of Robinson, there was a knock on the door of the interview room, and Deputy Chief Ray Vetter and a Monsignor from the Toledo Catholic Diocese came in. William was instructed to leave the room, and the Deputy Chief and Monsignor spoke privately to Robinson. They left the room without filling anyone else in on what had been discussed. By day five of the trial, 
prosecutors were intent on convincing the jury that the murder weapon was in Robinson's hand when Sister Margaret was murdered. They presented the strong possibility that Sister Margaret was stabbed 31 times with an unusual letter opener, and it was later found in the locked quarters of Father Gerald Robinson, who again was the chaplain at Mercy Hospital. They called several witnesses to argue that very few people had access to Robinson's quarters in the hospital. One of the witnesses was a cleaning woman named Valerie, who testified that she was directed to clean up the sacristy area where the blood was found, included blood stains on the floor. She had a vague memory of cleaning blood from the sink in the chapel, which was an indication that the killer may have tried to clean up or clean up the evidence there. Valerie also testified that she saw the letter opener in Robinson's quarters. She said it was on his desk when she was in there cleaning. And Valerie, as well as two other hospital employees, testified that the locked doors in the hospital quarters were not easily breached. The keys were secured in a locked box that few people could open, and Valerie could only access Robinson's quarters by having a supervisor unlock the door for her. Showing that no one else had access to the priest's quarters doesn't 100% place the letter opener in his hand when Sister Margaret was killed, but it definitely seems to increase the likelihood. When it comes down to it, the prosecution's case came down to the simple proposition that no one else could have committed the heinous crime, which involved a ritual strangulation and repeated stabbing of the 71-year-old nun. They argued that the priest had been fed up with Sister Margaret's supposed nitpicking, and the two had an argument the day before her murder in which she chastised him for cutting the sacred Good Friday Mass short instead of having a traditional full-length service. When the trial ended, the jury of eight women and four men deliberated for six hours over two days. In May 2006, The jury in that Lucas County courtroom rendered a verdict in the trial. Robinson stood as common police judge Thomas Osawick read the verdict about 11.30 a.m., but he displayed the same emotional detachment that he had through the nearly month-long trial. They found that Gerald Robinson was guilty of murdering Sister Margaret. The judge immediately sentenced Robinson to the mandatory term of 15 years to life in prison. Armed bailiffs led the disgraced priest out of the courtroom just four minutes after the judge read the verdict. As he entered the hallway and headed for the county jail, he was met with applause from those waiting outside. For his part, Father Robinson continued to proclaim his innocence, although he failed in a series of appeals. In July 2014, Father Gerald Robinson died in prison at the age of 76, one month after suffering a heart attack. And that's all for this episode of Great Lakes True Crime. But now that special surprise. I want to let you know about an accomplishment I made recently. Some of you may have picked up on the fact that I'm a huge fan of the Canadian TV series Republic of Doyle, which originally aired from January 2010 to December 2014. One of the great characters of that show was a crime novelist named Garrison Steele, played by legendary actor Victor Garber. He was the ship captain in Titanic, if you don't know who he is. Anyway, Steele had a knack for coming up with cheesy novel titles, and my accomplishment was going through his episodes and writing down all of them. So here they are, every Garrison Steele novel mentioned in the TV show Republic of Doyle. To Kill a Murderer, Tic Tac Death, To Kill a Ghost, The Special Detective, The Killer Corpse, 666 O'Clock, Tinker Tailor Soldier Dead, Dead Man Crawling, My Favorite Innocent Until Proven Dead, Guilt by Innocence, Half Past Murder, and finally, Knock, knock, you're dead. 
Unfortunately, Netflix is removing Republic of Doyle in the United States. But if you find it on a different platform, I strongly suggest you check out this show if you've never seen it before. Also, if you don't follow us on social media yet, please do so by searching for Great Lakes True Crime on Twitter or Facebook. If you'd like to help out the show, there are a few ways you can do so. One way is to tell a friend about us. Word of mouth is a great way to get the word out about the show. And second, be sure to subscribe to the show on your podcast app. And finally, it's really important that we continue to receive your positive five-star reviews. I really appreciate the ones that we've gotten recently, so keep it up, please. For Great Lakes True Crime, this is Steve, your host and producer. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening, guys.